12 o'clock now, so we might start. Okay, great. We're start something. It's now 12 o'clock. Okay, so... And I'm talking to you over the uh, telephone. Okay, great. So I'll introduce the show. This is uh, Paula Gloria with Farther Down the Rabbit Hole, and uh, Harold Channer is on the line, and he's streaming from Rabbit Hole Central on December 26, uh, 2007, and I'm joined today by my mother because uh, my mom and I have been looking at some of Harold Channer's postings with a man named Louis Kelso. And so I thought that maybe, uh, you know, I could ask my mom a few comments sort of as a barometer of, of how we might reintroduce this to the world. That would be good. Could you introduce me to your mother, please? Oh, yeah, excuse me. <laughs> Harold, this is my mom, Genevieve Tsakonis. Hello, uh, Genevieve. Oh, it's a you? pleasure to meet with you. you the I same see you. that uh, Paula Gloria comes from such very good stock. <laughs> well, she's a, a good fusion of Greek and German background. A pretty good combo, <laughs> huh? Your voices are a little distant as I hear them over my telephone, but I well, suppose you're monitoring things at that end, Paula, as far as the audio and everything? Yeah, I, it, it's just sort of the way it's set up. If you can just bear with gotcha. us. Gotcha. That's okay. fine. Okay, and thanks. And the thing is, I'll just talk over the telephone rather, uh, you know, at the line rather than the speaker. Is that a little better or what? Yeah, no, you're coming up nicely. Very well. Okay, fine. Well, then... <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just getting myself together here at this end. Genevieve, it's a great pleasure to meet you well, over the you. telephone and uh, <laughs> look forward to doing so I'm a as true your Westerner. <laughs> say in person at some point in time in the future. <laughs> yeah, thank you. My pleasure. Okay, Gloria, yeah, Paula, it's all in your hands now, so it's good to be in touch with you, and I'm glad you had a good Christmas, I do hope. Yeah, we did. I think, I think what our concern was, I mean, what my mom pointed out was, um, now that Kelso's gone, who, who carries the torch for this understanding well, of binary economics? Well, I, I guess it's, uh, there, it, there's always people, because the, there was enough uh, interest in the idea, particularly intellectuals and so forth, and, and Lewis was pretty well known by a number of people. He was a very successful um, attorney, and um, he, he was um, he used to attend the meetings at the Bohemian Grove and so forth. And he was able to talk to a lot of people within the within the establishment, you might call it. Yes. So he had a number of people who were familiar with him. He, I suppose a lot of people thought of him as a sort of gadfly, bringing up ideas that are outside the realm of most thinking. But he had. A, but there's always some people at the core, and I think probably that follow, that carry on after someone passes like that. But I, I would think probably uh, first and foremost would be um, his uh, widow. Uh, that would be uh, Patricia Heder Kelso, who co-authored two books with him and was working very closely with him. And they do have a site that, they, that she has, uh, in a certain sense, been involved with putting up on the Internet. It's called... I think it's called KelsoInstitute.net, I believe. But I'll get the, I'll be, before we hang up, I'll, I'll get for sure the link to that site that uh, Patricia Howder Kelso is involved with, with some others. And then there are people, there are a couple of people that I know of, a couple, three people that I know of that have been carrying that, uh, that idea forward and writing a new on it and so forth. And one would be uh, <clears throat> one, of the, one of my dear friends, <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a tickle in my throat. Uh, one of my dear friends in Washington, one of the first program with, and that was in um, that Norman Curlin in Washington. Paul, I'm a little bit in a dilemma. I'm getting a call coming in. Should I take that? Um, yeah, go ahead and take it. And while you're now, gone, you won't be getting it. I, well, let, okay, let's take the call. And let's, okay. I'll put it on speaker. Okay. Um, while Harold is on that other call, I just. I just want to point out that uh, I'm going to try to bring up to him that now that the elections are coming up, we have a couple candidates who seem to be putting alternatives on the table. Ron Paul seems to be talking about dismantling the Federal Reserve, and then Dennis Kucinich, uh, Nico Haupt and I had the you know great opportunity to place in his hands uh, some oh, papers. Hello? Yeah, Harold? All right, just 
Yeah. You're back with us? Uh, in, in, in any case, uh, Harold and I have worked together quite a bit, and one thing that attracts me hello, to... Hello, hello, Paula? Yeah. Oh? Yes. Yeah, I'm... that was Bob Ashford. Oh, great. Calling me, uh, unknowing that we're streaming. I said, are we streaming? And then I said, did you have a, a computer? He said he didn't have high speed or something, and then I went to switch the speaker thing, and we got disconnected from him somehow. Right. But that was the person... I hope maybe he can call me back. Uh -huh. um, he was calling me, I presume, from camp. I think he's down in Florida now. Wow. But but So I'll have to carry on and then get back to Bob, I guess, because I can't talk to you. Yeah, I am calling I, again. So uh, what should I do? I'm confused. The speaker doesn't seem to be working right. And, uh, well, go, 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 go ahead. And, I'll come back. Hold on for yeah, a second. Okay. Go to Bob and explain that's great. to him, okay? Okay, Hold that's on. fine. Uh, Bob Ashford, Robert Ashford, is a professor at Syracuse, and he is the one that um, actually you listened to yes, yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Very impressed. Mm -hmm. you, what did you think of him compared to Kelso? Oh well, he's uh, he's got more vigor, of course, with his uh, he's younger and he's uh, very clear and direct, and uh, that's it. So you liked Robert Ashford's presentation. Well, I got a, a lot out of it. Oh, well, that's great. Because, you know, I want to... Anyway, Robert is going to be at Harold's in a couple of days, so maybe we can do some streaming with, uh, with Robert Ashford. But what I was going to say before is that these concepts don't lay blame at people's feet so that uh, Marshall Rosenberg's concept about punishment never works all of a sudden becomes more important uh, in steering a course towards a more successful future. That in other words, like with nonviolent communication, you go, uh, what, uh, what is most alive in me and what Hello, would make, Paula? make life more wonderful? Hello, yes. Paula? Yes. Yeah, were you able to hear Bob? No, I can't hear him. You cannot hear him over the no, telephone. Maybe, You're maybe, not getting it over the telephone. No, maybe tomorrow I can go to my father's and I can figure out another way that we can... Okay, uh, but you're able to hear me and record yes, it? Yes, yes. And I'm, and I'm really oh. glad to have the dynamism of all these different ideas. I was just saying while yeah, you were... Yeah, let, let me... I'm just getting it straight because Bob's holding on the line. Okay, and I well, tell... He could engage in the conversation if it's being recorded, but you're not hearing him. No. No. Okay, let me go and tell him that I'll call him back later after we're Yeah, it'll through, have to okay? be another day. Because yeah, great. his voice is not being recorded, apparently. No, no. O okay, let me do that, and then I'll come okay. back to you, okay? Okay. Yeah, great. Okay. Okay. It's, it's nice, though, how all the energies are coming together. You know, we get a feeling of where we can put the technology. But I was saying, Marshall Rosenberg said, what's most alive in me? And now a lot of people, what is most alive is there's a lot of discontent about looming foreclosures and uh, joblessness and, you know, people feeling helpless. And I think then they strike out at, and, and lash out at what's most immediate to be causing the problem. And what I appreciated about Kelso was he helped to identify what would make life more wonderful, which is Marshall Rosenberg's second step. After you know what's most alive in you, you know what would make life more wonderful and you can put a request out. Mm. So to my, whom? The government? Well, <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. To whom would be first of okay, all... Okay, Paula, hello. Yeah, yeah. So you weren't able to hear Bob. That was Bob uh, serendipitously no. calling in, and uh, but his voice isn't being recorded, so I told him I would no. call him back later. So I was just soldiering along to say, using Marshall Rosenberg's principles of what's most alive in me, and then what would make life more wonderful, what I'm thinking is, can we use... Uh, the experience that you've had with Kelso, and even my mother knew about some of, of his more uh, applied uh, theories with stock ownership, could we start to, in the future, kick in more of the ideas that he had? Do you well, have... sure, we could, but let me just finish where I left off when Bob called, and I'm not going to sure. take any other, try to take any other calls because it seems not to be Doesn't recorded yeah. on your tape, and that's what's primarily the thing here. And I just said to the people, Patricia Heather Kelso and then Norman Curlin down in Washington, and then Robert Ashford, 
is a writer on it. He wrote the book uh, Binary Economics, The New Paradigm. And I think you could include in that uh, um, um, Rodney Shakespeare, who's a Cambridge tutor or from Cambridge uh, in, in London in England as a tutor. And he and Bob Ashford had written that seminal book, uh, Binary Economics, The New Paradigm. And those are the people that are largely carrying on the idea at the core. I see. So that's what I was doing when Bob called. So let's just add that to the program. And then, yes, by all means. Do you know, Harold, if they've approached Dennis Kucinich or, or Ron Paul, any of the candidates? I'm not sure they probably would. They would be approaching most anybody, I would think, that would be able to give it a hearing and, um, and so forth. I, I really don't know, um, you know, because they're, 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 it's, it's an idea that's very uh, all-encompassing in a way, and you probably could approach most anybody if they were willing to have a listen from, uh, across the wide spectrum of the political spectrum, from far left to far right and people in the center. But uh, it's not something that's on the lips of uh, most people as they think in traditional terms about economic policy or political reality or anything of that sort. So whether or not they have, there's some people have tried to approach some of those people on the political scene, but I don't think it's core to any of the candidates there. I think it would be very good if there were a presidential figure that could actually, uh, as they say in the... Uh, jazz clubs cotton on to the idea, but I don't think anyone has been able to do that to the point where they would find a receptive audience if they were to try and talk to them about it. What happened with Russell Long in 1974, because he, he became a Kelsonian? Well, he did, and he was in favor of the idea, and the idea got a lot of support. But you're really, you're talking about something that's very radical, and people don't, I think, realize the radical nature of it. And radical means go to the roots of things rather than the, uh, you know, the, the, the ordinary reality that we hear on the news and so forth. And, uh, but he did get uh, a, a great deal of support. They were able to get uh, what it would call, be called bipartisan support. Both Republican and Democrats were able to, in a certain sense, uh, consider the idea, and they they were able to get uh, I don't know ten to twelve pieces of legislation built upon the support largely Russell Long. He was such a power and so forth that encouraged um, oh uh, tax uh, uh, credits and that sort of thing that would encourage uh, the the general notion of um, of binary economics that Lewis had had, um, had pioneered. And that program we did with him in 1974, for instance, they were they were considering the Rail Reorganization Act of that year, uh, which was before the Congress, and they were able to involve, in terms of the financing, ideas that, that could incorporate some of those ideas of uh, of Lewis's. Um, it was not able to be uh, It was never able to be done in a systems way that would make the system, uh, you know, a whole systems way. So they had to deal with things like the ESOP, the Employee Stock Ownership Plan, which got some support because that built ownership into the employees of a particular corporate entity. And uh, so they got support for that, and it was carried. But then it got overridden largely by uh, traditional argumentation from the left and the right and so forth in the political process. Say, Harold, it's just an idea because I always like to work on very local levels. What if, uh, what if the owner of the village scandal, who I know is a very open-minded person, I mean, she got me working there just because she was interested in my TV show and she wanted to, you know, do what she could to support yeah. the cause. How, what if she wanted to become interested in a, in a more efficient way of running her store with an ESOP process? Where would she go to learn about it? Well, I don't know. There are a number of people around, and Lewis used to make the point that uh, he had a company. He was an investment banker, among other things. Right. But he would make the point that um, you know that it is important that the structure of the of the entity, particularly within the truncated structural support for an economic theory that would involve ESOP, uh, it would involve uh, binary economic notions. It was limited almost only to, or could be understood only by people 
within, a, let's say, a corporate enclave. There were a number, Avis Rent-A-Car, Wirtin Steel, some very large billion-dollar corporations mm-hmm. did uh, try to institute things. Um, uh, there, were, there were a number of large entities that did that, and they got that, that thing along the line of trying to build ownership into the employees within a corporate enclave. And there was quite a bit of that done. And he had an investment banking house here in New York. And he was the first ever to, um, to do it back in the 50s. He, 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 he was the first ever to use what they called a leveraged buyout where a, an entity would use the corporate assets as collateral. Uh, and he did it for a newspaper chain in California that built the ownership into the employees of that newspaper chain. But there, there were a number of things done, and there are quite a few companies, and it also goes around the world. There's some employee-owned companies in Europe and so forth, so it's still the embers are still there. But it was never able to be instituted as a basic, um, as a basic policy at a basic policy level that would give it systems efficiency for the whole economy. That was not able to be done. That that waits for the future and for the the good works of Paul and Gloria and so forth. And Harold Channer. To, to, to bring to the attention of let's say a mass movement of understanding among the people that would give political support to people who could take it up as a serious grounding policy statement for, let's say, a presidential view of the overall world and national economy. And well, that hasn't been able to come to the fore. We're well, still arguing over the same, you know, supply side, demand right, side right, notions right. of what, uh, you know, how the policies to be, at but, a policy uh, level, we're uh, going to struck. And there were some institutional changes that would have been encouraged yeah, within the right. Congress that have not been able to be done. So that's where it stands. I really don't know what to tell somebody who wants to think about doing something. That's why I, I'm not very interested myself in mm-hmm. thinking there's something you can do uh, until we get the, the system right. You know, that, that's my way. And so the, the place to bring up that kind of thing in a systems way is within, uh, like, the realm of public access and public awareness and a, a public awakening to the idea that we need something different than the traditional left-wing, right-wing political dialectic that we see in this presidential campaign and so forth. Well, like Harold, when when 1974, uh, when you had that interview that Nelson Rockefeller's office kept calling Time Warner to find out when it was going to be airing, uh, that, that, what happened? Did it air a few times? Did that galvanize anything? Did that start well, a populist? It, 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 it's a... See, I have a hard time because I try to deal with it. Uh, and, and is it Genevieve? Is that your name? Yes, there? thanks. Uh-huh. I'm sorry, your mother's name? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, he, um, I just wanted to, to reach out in a sense because she had some knowledge of that. But um, it was, um, it wasn't, it wasn't ever able to be done in the fullness of the theory, like the general theory that Mr. Keynes put forth had a whole series of institutional structures and it was able to be seen in a, in a comprehensive way. And that hasn't ever been able to be done. Well, I um, think it was One of Lewis's arguments the was up. that if, uh, if the assets are, are actually yeah. increasingly responsible for production and we're going to set up a system where we are seriously going to form capital or capital accumulation, um, which is increasingly responsible for production without the labor theory of value informing it, um, then you would have to have a, a system where the, there, would be an, there would be a large-scale growth, uh, and because he had the ESOP, Employee Stock Ownership Plan, then there were seven other systems of financing that could be employed as a system. So that public works, water works, rail, the railroad in the case of the Rail Reorganization Act, uh, utilities, uh, large entities would be able to be included in a process where the ownership of the stock in those companies would be distributed widely among the citizens and there are various ways in which that could be assigned. And if you were going to have it sort of like Social Security in a way, it's a very a responsible system that's in place and has political support. But if you're going to have real distribution of income distributed that way, then you're going to have to have some sort of a way of finessing or dealing with the risk involved. And the capitalists, particularly venture-minded people and so forth, 
will always be treating everything as though everything is a great risk, whereas much of the financing of what we know what to do is really very, very sure, and you could go up the scale of risk. And he said you'd have to invigorate the casualty insurance um, system or industry. It's an industry, uh, sort of like Lloyd's of London was, against loss. And there would be, uh, it could be part of a, uh, a cost of doing business. You'd have an insurance payment, a premium you pay against loss. The feasibility studies would all be there as far as the wisdom or the appropriateness of the thing to be financed. And then if it was also going to include the broad general citizenry rather than, let's say, the, the, the people who go to Wall Street and shoot craps, and it's a crap shoot, it's a gamble, that sort of thing, then he had said there should be an institution over to the side of the Federal Reserve Board that would be reinsuring the casualty insurance industry, and that's never been able to be established. You would be upping the guarantee of the full faith and credit of the American system against business loss because you're dealing with the folks, not with some gamblers in the stock market, as had been the case and the, the, the view in which people see the, uh, you know, the investment community. And that's never been able to be established to go into larger scale uses of the, of, of the concept. Um, so that's where it stands, and we're still uh, more or less, and, and there are some companies, and there is an ESOP association. Uh, we did a program, I think you maybe helped me do it, with a man named Keeling. He's the head of the ESOP association, a very large, and involves a great number of uh, major entities and so forth, people that have set up, uh, particularly along the ESOP, or the Employee Stock Ownership Plan. But the, the idea at a large systems level hasn't been able to be established. It should be. It probably would take a presidential uh, attention in order to get the kind of changes that would be needed to make it as an efficient system. I'm getting a call, but I'm going to ignore oh, but, it. But Harold, um, in 1974, when Russell Long was giving it attention, the president was Nixon? Yes. Yeah. Well, no, he had been uh, impeached in the water and so forth, but... Who was the um, who was the it, president then? I'm sorry. What? Who was the president in in 1974? I don't when? know. Was it Ford? I don't know. Whoever came in after Nixon was had to leave office and so forth. He he won overwhelmingly in '72, didn't he? And then he the Watergate thing came, and then there was all of that, and then Mr. Ford had to fill in for oh. Mr. Nixon, and then it, the traditional forces came into play and uh, neutered a lot of uh, what might have made possible that, that way of thinking on a large scale. And um, it also ties in, I, for myself, I tend to think of it in large terms, and I tend to think of it in terms of the whole evolution of the universe and so forth. And this, this these programs with Dorian Sagan and his mother, Lynn Margulis, the leading biologist in the world, and they had a, a book called Dazzle Gradually, and that real change or large-scale change, you, it can't come all at once in one no. fell swoop, apparently, because it would be too much for the human consciousness I to encompass. That so they, it has to dazzle gradually or all men be blind, as Emily Dickinson put it. So it's probably a measure of that, and it's been maturing, and the situation is that, Paul, that he and Patricia Heather Kelso called in the two-factor theory, that there's two factors to production rather than one unifactor, like labor theory of value, that would have to come because it's such a big and transformative idea that it couldn't come just in one fell swoop, and I expect that's the case. It's time is perhaps coming now, I think, but that's, uh, so it doesn't happen like that overnight. It happens slowly, and things are made, changed, and then we try a few things, and we've gone way out on the supply side now with the neocons and everything, and now the, the Democrats groups? are coming in, and they'll go over to the demand side and everything, and what they're going to have to end up with, in my view, is the simul financing thing where you build ownership into the masses as an uh, instrument of income distribution as well as capital formation, but it didn't happen. It hasn't happened. It's still... Uh, to be discovered, as it were, by mass consciousness as an answer, and by the progressive community, I would think, what's generally called the left the community, start. they've been blinkered. In my view, I may be wrong, because as I consider J Lewis's general theory, the allocation of those, um, those ownership stakes 
in the in the in the private sector that he would be encouraging so forth were in a certain sense to be allocated politically. So it may be that some of the people, or you have to keep a window open in a synergistic way of understanding things to the idea that the argumentation of the socialists may be uh, able to be brought in, that you're going to use the, you know, you're, if you're going to allocate resources on a large scale, as a, like we did with Social Security, that money's invested in a certain way, and we build a system that's very popular, we could probably think about scaling up the level of risk that is used with the Social Security Trust Fund and other things by having instruments to guard against loss for things that are very secure, really, in terms mm -hmm. of the needs that were obviously there. And that sort of thing would probably have to come in now. But it doesn't just sort of happen overnight. So, Harold, that website that Kelso's wife is, uh, is, is taking care of, it has seven points of, of different areas. You said utilities. and So that would explain how the transformation would take place to a more uh, capital distributed among the population society. As opposed well, yeah. to an oligarchy? Yeah, yeah it, it does. And and, uh, and also, see, I can't go because I'm streaming now, apparently. And so right. I can't go to my website. I don't think I can don't, go. Don't worry. I'll, I'll do it I in... Can. Harold, but, Harold, Harold, I'll do it in post-production. We'll put okay. the website up yeah, in post-production. Yeah, the post Institute, I think it is, uh, dot net, I think. But, uh, They've but got I, all of his writings. they got the Capitalist Manifesto. It's a free download. Anybody can get in that kind of thing. And they're, they're carrying that idea through. And the general theory that sort of mimics Keynes' general theory um, uh, does have all these different things, uh, uh, residential systems. Uh, the, the whole financing of the economy could be done in a way that would involve the mass of the citizenry in um, ownership of assets as an instrument of income distribution. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, Sid Greenfield is another fellow. He's going to be involved with Bob in this conference. They're having an early He's January uh, mm -hmm. with a lot He's of law professors. Sid He's written a really good paper on it, tying it into the idea of tycoon and some of those ideas. But, but getting the essence of it uh, very nicely down in a paper that I'll try and make a copy of and send off to you if I can. Well, Harold, what really interests me about looking at that website is I want to see where Google and YouTube fit in. I think that will be very revealing because uh, we may have an institution that's more populist oriented, in which case the radicalness of the populist, uh, you know, bent on it may be very timely. And it may yes, be. Yes, I think you're right. I think you're, you know, I think the most important thing going now is the Paula Gloria stream going on the internet talking about it. And I remind you, my dear, that we've now run out of time for the okay. program that you're recording. Okay, that's. You might want to say goodbye. Yeah, that's fine. And uh, I'm just rambling on here. No, no, no. You might want to do that. So, what I'll do is I'll close this show. This is Paula Gloria coming to you from Berkeley, California with my mother, Genevieve Tsakonis. And we've had a discussion with Harold Channer, who's been kind enough to keep my stream going on rabbitholecentral.tv while I deal with some of the technicals here. So stay tuned for future shows. And I definitely want to see if we can get more synergy out there. So thank you, okay. Harold. Okay, good to talk to you, Genevieve. Good to talk to you. Forward you to meeting you. And good to talk to you, Paula. Okay, bye. Bye. At the grassroots level and let's see let me just say goodbye we're all through <laughs> I go oh just stay a second we'll say oh yeah hello hey Harold now that we're off I, I just to talk to you again yeah yeah <laughs> so you, we I got a lot of rambling and everything we got all kinds of things Did going on here a lot of court date things coming up and all kinds of things and everything What's so that? Did you we're kind of rambled? uh going like uh, crazy. Did, were you yeah, ever recording yeah, because everything? because he's far off on all, he's tying the whole thing together and I'm just looking at the simple, very simple beginning. Can you hear that? Yes, I can hear you. You sound a little distant. I don't know if the mic is a little far away, yeah. but that's... Yeah, I am far away. <laughs> I, am, I am far away, but <laughs> anyway, I'm... Uh, no, that's okay. I just, this is my uh, grass...
I feel I'm a grassroots person on this, what I've witnessed and what I vaguely recall about my husband actually participating in a company that was doing this. And um, so um, when we, um, we'll get more information about the grassroots feeling, but I think about those ads on the business news of this big egg being rolled around. Uh, there's so much uh, encouragement for people to think about their nest egg, and uh, we either rely on Social Security completely, but, uh, well, you know all that, but um, if, if things, we don't, uh, well, uh, there's a lot of, uh, if people want facts about Nixon and all that, they can get it, but uh, we want to see a human nature wanting to feel the security of having something behind them as in our obligation we don't want to have, uh, be just taken care of it would be wonderful if we had something where we earned it we put in it well the theory of social security of course we earned it from the beginning hopefully but um, the social security trust fund yeah. by people who worked at a job and gained income by their labor participation and, and production. And I know people who, um, who were before Social Security and uh, didn't get anything, but they did uh, and buy telephone stocks in those days, and that's what saved a lot of people. On their own, they did their saving and scraping around. <laughs> so, But they, they didn't uh, have a their very own company. That's why this would be quite personal, I believe. If, uh, yeah, I think you're probably right, and at a level that's very interesting and very pragmatic and yeah. everything. It, it happened, there are some people that are interested in that. Bob Ashford, for instance, who had called in earlier, and Paul has been in touch with and so forth, well, is very much geared toward the practical realities of what can be done, and Norman Curlin certainly is. Um, I happen not to be. That's the problem. I'm, I'm very um, looking at the whole picture, you know. Well, Con yes, I realize that, and I haven't been, but I've only, it's what I've seen, and I, I am a pragmatic person. If it, I keep checking, does this work, does this work? And then if I lose in the stock market, I buy something else, but I never put all my eggs in the same basket. That's my theory, and, and, um, and, and recognizing your own needs, people should do that. If, uh, if Van Gogh can go off and paint and he has the supplies from his brother who sends him the paints and the oils, the bill, yeah, well, um, but look how <laughs> it is now. <laughs> he had faith in himself, whatever. He had to cut off his ear, you know, because he was so frustrated because well, he um, couldn't, he would like to have been successful, but it wasn't successful Maybe until it, was it good that he $35 just... million dollars in Sotheby's. But look, at <laughs> it could be that, uh, that such experience, as long as he had his brother supplying what he needed, he could keep painting. What if the, the system itself had supplied what he needed, uh, not only his needs, but also his reasonable wants and so forth in a systematic way that was growing? Well, let's think of the kind creativity. Of Think of the creativity that would burst forth. This a gigantic renaissance of the human spirit that could yeah. come forth if we ever get the right system to give people that the, elemental security. The little, so they, uh, it'll end up whereas now most people do not think about anything other than money, it seems. That's the only guide by which they judge things. And if we could get to a point where nobody's having to think about those things and are still living a reasonably good life because the collective capability is such that allows us to have that kind of a system, I think we would be in for a worldwide renaissance of the human spirit and create real creativity rather than, uh, you know, manipulating stock values. And so well, we make it, it's just been a lot harder. Mozart died young, too. They always needed a patron, a patron. So, uh, now, what, if we you don't start want writing that the... up, about 20 billion people uh -huh. on the planet by 2020, and uh, we've got all that thing going on in China, and, and they've got systems in place that do not, 
As far as Mr. Stiglitz, I don't know if you're familiar with him at Columbia. He's, I think he was Nobel Prize winner and also was uh, <laughs> chief economist of the World Bank and so forth. He says the system serves well, as it always has. Maybe the, let's be generous and say the upper 20% of the world population is able to live fairly well in their gated communities and mm -hmm. so forth. But for 60 to 80% of the world population are not well served by the system of... Uh, uh, the economic system, and you've got women in Africa wondering which of their two babies they're going to let starve to death because there's not enough food to eat, when we know we have the capability collectively of uh, providing for everybody in an unprecedentedly abundant way. Harold, well, that's what China tries to do, feed their people first now. Yeah, that's always the case. And, um, and there are a number of people, I could maybe get some links through Paula or something to you, of uh, people that are much more practical than myself, right? But Harold, I'm along not. I'm, I'm thinking Harold, about the whole Harold, <laughs> along the lines of practical people, uh, you know, I talked to, uh, to, to Margaret about, you know, using the wonderful capital asset of your living room, not only for a Christmas party, but maybe we could uh, collect some of these thinkers together. And, and put the word out that, that we do want to bring people from different, different perspectives. Yeah, well, that's a thought and everything, and it's something that is, you know, she, she uh, but uh, in both cases, both Margaret and I, this is like our home. I know. And it, we're not particularly interested in just having one group of people after another coming through here like a public space. Right. We want to protect the fact that this is a private space. Well, I know, and but... that uh, we're, we're, we've got things we're doing. Well, right, right, I, my, right. My thought is, I, myself... Uh, right now, uh, right now, my mom is creeping off the out, bed. Reach out by Skype to some of the people around the world and so forth from I here. I love it. I love it. Tell you me. love what? The discussion is so stimulating, I have to... <laughs> my mother said the discussion is so stimulating <laughs> that... To go off and <laughs> relax. She has her. to go off and relax well, now. We, we've been, we've been conducting... Like We've and been... we're under some pressure now, Glory. We had to, uh, Paula, we have to get the camera fixed. I know. And Joe just called, and then we've got things that are of a personal nature with the courts and so right. forth. It's pressing. Okay, well, we're going to sign off now. Way, you know. We're going to sign off now. I just want to say we've conducted all of this on our, uh, in my brother's bedroom. <laughs> there you go. There you go. You see, and it can be done with what we have, and you can reach out to the world. Exactly. And we'll reach out to Bob, and we have to get him with a camcorder so he isn't uh, all upset about the idea of getting out. And it's going to be in the realm of public access that the ideas are going to emerge. Right. But I know for myself, I want to, I know Maggie, and I know that she's a private person. I know. And you, you got a problem of everybody saying, well, I've, I want to have an art show, I want to have this, I want to have that. And no, I know. Face and everything. But that's something you have to, in a certain sense, guard against because we're busy. I know. Doing things the way we're doing things now, you know. But I know. But anyway, I'm going to post this right now, and as soon as you get the website, if you could email that to me. I'll then, do it within a minute, a few minutes. As soon as I, I just don't know if when I'm streaming, which I guess I still am. I don't know. I, I haven't turned it off yet. I, I'm actually going to put this last part up because I liked you and my mom discussing, you know, the practicalities. Yeah, as far as okay. I'm concerned, you put anything up. You I know, know you're, you're wonderful it was very that nice way. talking to her, and I understand somebody who's got some, you know, wanting to have some, and Sid wrote a paper that is very much geared that way. Yeah. And I'm going to try, and if I can figure out how to make the damn copier work, I'll copy that and send it off to you. Sid's going to be involved in that conference, and that's another thing. Bob's calling because he's arranging this conference on the 3rd. Okay. Uh, with law professors from all around the country, a good deal of, uh, it's a segment of their association that's going to be dealing with what he calls socio-economics, trying to get a broader context of understanding economics. Is that open and to the public, Harold? No, it's not. It's not, okay. No, okay. but I'm going to see. Oh, he, he, I was thinking of maybe talking to somebody who could help him in terms of, it's going to be at the Hilton Hotel, you know, on 6th Avenue. Uh-huh. And it's kind of a big thing. He's put a lot of effort into doing that. And he's going to need or want some people who might be able to help him archive some of the people that it is. There's a keynote address and there's a couple of sections on binary. And I'm wondering if maybe I have to, Joe just called today 
we talk to him, or maybe Mr. Goldberg might be interested in getting absolutely in terms of, of copy uh, of doing some archiving. Absolutely, to Scott. Support Bob in his effort because Bob's the only person in the United States of America that's teaching binary economics. Right. So right. I, but most people won't see that. You see, they won't. Harold, Harold, con contact Scott Goldberg because he loves the fact that we're putting positive, positive uh, solutions. Or, or possibilities on the table. Well, and you're going to have a hard time getting a lot of people who, who are concerned with public access, the so-called progressives, to be interested in something that's going to be talking about a, a book called The Capitalist Manifesto when they've been raised like mother's milk on the Communist Manifesto of Karl Marx. Well, you'd be surprised what what's going to be coming out of the 9-11, uh, reinvestigate 9-11 movement. Yeah, that's going know. to stir up a lot of, uh, of uh, systems-wide uh, angst uh, about the system and so forth. Right, and so that's, that's why that's why it's important. Community. That's why it's important yeah. to have these uh, these positive uh, new paradigms on the table. Well, they're, they're paradigms that I believe in. At least the principles are important. And that's why I'm not actually interested in doing much of anything. I'm interested that we get the ideas right first. If we get the idea, then maybe there will be something to which people can repair to get a sense of how we're going to address the, con the what's confronting the human condition writ large. Right. And so that's my thinking. Well, that that's sure. why that's why I'm looking for a physical space where people can meet. You know, because oh, they're, yeah. they're, yeah. they're well, I know it, we, they're meeting yeah. down at Ground Zero and they're protesting and they're yelling and you know, but that's not the physical space I'm thinking about. I'm thinking of something You're thinking quiet. Like a salon or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good idea. And I, Some, something, I, something to sort of physicalize uh, rabbit hole central dot TV. I mean, I can, uh, you know, when Webster was here, I packed forty people into my little apartment. <laughs> good for you. you. Know? That's really efficiency. That's you, an efficient were, use of space. You were there, Harold. Fuller, you were I know there. Mr. Fuller used to say the uh, geodesic structures. You know, right? The most efficient way to include space, doing more with less, and that's all there. I just, on my part, knowing Maggie, yeah, I have to guard against the idea that there's going to be a stream of people who want to set up an art show or a, you know, no, something I know. like that. And everybody would like to just be here all the time. And I know that's not good for her consciousness. Yeah, yeah. Because she's very private. No, I understand. So that's just a problem that emerges. So we got to. But get, that was get, but that was nice because she let us do a little shot of cleaning up the room uh, the day after the party, and I think that was good because I know people just long for a real connection, like my viewers in India. The littlest things that they can see of New York City is yeah. really really interesting because it's not going through this corporate shine and yeah you know, know what i mean i know they're so sick of that kind of thing have i got a deal for you it's like yeah see eddie bouncing out of the uh, yeah but but but, but, but when you see somebody walking around you know cleaning up after a party you go wow they're just yeah, real people that, just real people it's, yeah it's at a human <laughs> level and you've really been good at that and then there's also her, and then there's also me, and I, I am not particularly, I'm not particularly interested in having one group after another after another talking about their thing, uh, yeah. doing it here, that's all, because we're busy. Got no, well, well let, let's... It works better. I would rather, I'm more inclined toward wanting to use Skype to reach out to people. We're going to do a program with Robert Monk. Right. He's an important person. We've got his book. We're reading that. There's time to read. And if you got other people here, you have to talk about what they're talking about. No, I understand. But you're my M. Paula. And yeah. Because you're going to reach out. You would want to reach out and get all 20 billion people involved, in, and we'll all get together and make an apple pie. No, but I'm trying to be... And there's great wisdom in that. But, Harold, I'm trying to you're be... You're really democratic, yeah. Harold, I'm trying to be discriminating, too. That's why I'm interested in the Holocaust, the Jewish one, and the Armenian so one. We have a seminar on that. We have a seminar on 9-11 Truth. We have a seminar on Marx. We have a seminar on uh, Hegel. We could have a seminar on all kinds of things that people would want to do. Right. Okay, well, Harold, it's been great anyway, talking so to you. I'm going to post your mother, this. And I'm sorry if I uh, talk too much and everything, but I, have a, I hope you're having a wonderful... This is Boxing Day in the yes. English tradition. Right. So this is Boxing Day and a, a quasi-holiday uh, and so forth and everything. But So good. So then do, shall we try to do something again tomorrow? Let me, let me, I might be going over to my father's tomorrow and then I can get better internet access and maybe uh, get my dad to take a look at this Kelso stuff because 
I'd like to, you know, have different people's perspectives, particularly. Yeah, and you'd want to, you'd want to maybe. I think we're going to get Bob to where he's going to get, going to bother to get a webcam and be able to get joining in the skyping and that. That'd kind be of, fabulous. That's that'd what fabulous. we want to do, and then get other people. We're going to do that with Mr. Monks, and he's a major patrician. Uh, uh, before the Revolutionary War, the family goes way back, oh, and great. he's a traitor to his class. He's one of the patricians of our system. So we'll get some of those people and so forth, and people that will understand the intricacies of the financial system and all that kind of thing. It's involved, and there, but then there's a lot of different things, and I don't know. I'm a little under the...